Bernie Madoff. Even if you don't know the details of this case, I'm sure there's a good chance that you've heard the name Bernie Madoff before. Bernie played the long con. He gained trust, friends, allies, all before stabbing them in the back. He obliterated charities, retirement funds, investments. No one was safe. And yet he got away with this for years. So what is it that made him one of the worst yet most talented financial scammers of all time? Well, in today's episode of Multi-Level Mondays, that's exactly what we're going to find out. So hello, and welcome to Multi-Level Mondays, a weekly series all about pyramid schemes, Ponzi schemes, multi-level marketing, and other forms of business fraud. I'm the Illuminati, and today we're going to be talking about the Madoff investment scandal or the Bernie Madoff Ponzi scheme. This was one of the biggest and most notorious Ponzi schemes out there. So we've got a lot of ground to cover today, so we need to get right into it. And if you enjoy topics about white collar crime and scams, Ponzi schemes, pyramid schemes, and multi-level marketing, make sure that you're subscribed with notifications on so that you never miss a new episode when it goes live. So let's get into the basics. Who was Bernie Madoff? Bernard Lawrence Madoff was born on April 29th, 1938 in Queens, New York. One documentary states that he grew up in a family that had knowledge of the stock market. Apparently his mother owned a broker dealer firm out of her home until she shut down rather than file proper paperwork. So although it's not much to be said at this point in time, it doesn't seem like he probably had the best example of how to really run a business. According to The Independent, he appeared to make little academic impression at Far Rockaway High School or later at the University of Alabama or Hofstra University back in Long Island, where he got a degree in political science. However, Madoff was determined to make something of himself. He saved $5,000 from working as a lifeguard and in 1960 founded Madoff Investment Securities when he was just 22 years old. This was, as one source puts it, one of the iconoclastic firms who challenged the New York Stock Exchange's old school brokers using aggressive marketing techniques to win clients and promoting a new era of electronic trading. Madoff became something of a spokesperson for these outsiders and helped create the rival NASDAQ Electronic Stock Exchange where he later served as chairman. Although many people who came into contact with him on the golf courses of Florida have described him as aloof, he was clubbable for the right people and chummy with the finance industry's regulators at the Securities and Exchange Commission. They would rib each other. Madoff laughingly called enforcers at the SEC the enemy when his niece, the glamorous Shayna Madoff, married one of them. But the SEC relied on him and other members of his family to advise them on ways to modernize the markets. For a while, things seemed picture perfect for the Madoffs. Bernie's wife, Ruth, seemed to adapt and enjoy her New York high society life. She busied herself with philanthropic ventures, primarily those devoted to fighting cancer and supporting the arts. Bernie Madoff appeared trustworthy and hardly anything was amiss. When you look at timelines, whether it's CNN, Wikipedia, or The Guardian, not much is said in these early days. And for a time, things were good and things were seemingly legitimate. As another source states, the firm started in 1960 as a penny stock trader with $5,000, which is $43,000 today, that Madoff earned from working as a lifeguard and sprinkler installer. He further secured a loan of $50,000 from his father-in-law, which he also used to set up the firm. His business grew with the assistance of his father-in-law, accountant Saul Appern, who referred a circle of friends and their families. Initially, the firm made markets, quoted bid and ask prices via the National Quotation Bureau's pink sheets. In order to compete with firms that were members of the New York Stock Exchange trading on the stocks exchange floor, his firm began using innovative computer information technology to disseminate its quotes. After a trial run, the technology that the firm helped to develop became the NASDAQ. After 41 years as a sole proprietorship, the Madoff firm incorporated in 2001 as a limited liability company with Madoff as the sole shareholder. During these decades, Bernie built his connections and his circle. It was exclusive to invest with him, which as one source puts it, is his true genius of marketing. After all, if someone is so exclusive and so difficult to get in touch with, then they must be all the more legitimate, right? Seriously, he wouldn't even take people that had millions. He was a too cool for school veneer and his reputation as a financial wizard grew. Everyone was in awe of him, said Jerry Reisman, an attorney who met Madoff at a party. Madoff made it feel as if it was an exclusive club and that's how he sucked his people in. That's how he got them to go into this. And it was a fantastic, brilliant job of marketing. CNN Money wrote an article in which Madoff rejected an investor and explains, Larry Leaf and his business partner, a friend of Madoff, put their sporting goods company's pension fund with him in the late 1970s. The annual report returns, Leaf said, were between 14 and 18%. 
Eventually, Leaf gave Madoff his personal money to manage. Whenever Leaf needed to withdraw funds, he received checks promptly. But even Leaf, one of Madoff's oldest customers, found Madoff rejecting a request to take on new money from a friend. I wrote Mr. Madoff a letter 12 years ago asking him to take a new client who wanted to put 5 million with him, recalled Leaf. I came home, got a message that said, Larry, this is Bernie, I'm not taking any new clients. Then there was another message from Bernie later that day that said, that was rude of me, call me at my private number. Still, Madoff politely rejected Leaf's request to accept a new investor. When the stock market tripped into bear markets, Madoff would still report to his clients in detailed statements that his strategy of buying Standard & Poor's 100 stocks while trading puts and calls on the S&P 100, options to sell and buy the index, was consistently earning money. Even during the stock market tumble that began last autumn, Madoff reported better than 10% returns, said Leaf. On Wall Street, these individuals tend to actually only keep score based on how much money they've bought in each year, said Cass of Madoff's claim to deliver superior returns. That determines whether you're a success or failure. They get their identity from how solid their returns are. The point here is to say that even when other investment companies were losing people's money or getting them minimal returns, Madoff was by all accounts superior. He would turn away clients with millions of dollars. And now I know what you're thinking, or at least I know what I was thinking when I started all of this out and looking at everything. What about when people wanted to take money out of their account besides Leaf? Wouldn't that be the first red flag? Surely it couldn't take all that long for someone to realize Madoff was scamming them the second they asked for their money back. Well, that's where the Madoff Ponzi scheme and other Ponzi schemes I've talked about differ. Apparently, Fairfield Greenwich Group, whose clients invested about $7.5 billion with Bernie Madoff stated, "'We had no indication that we and many other firms and private investors were the victims of such a highly sophisticated, massive fraudulent scheme.'" At the court hearing, an individual investor who declined to give his name to avoid embarrassment expressed a similar sentiment. "'The returns were just amazing and we trusted this guy for decades. If you wanted to take money out, you always got your check in a few days. That's why we are all so stunned.'" And this, if you ask my opinion, is where Madoff's genius shows. Sure, he's despicable and cruel, but he is smart. See, a Ponzi scheme, if you aren't aware, is when someone or a small group of people gets money from investors and promises to give them a high return for low risk. However, the product or service that they're promised just does not exist. The head of a Ponzi scheme is just stealing money from them and the returns that they're making are often falsified. And I know I am simplifying things a lot here, but hopefully you get where I'm coming from. Now, with a lot of Ponzi schemes I've talked about on the channel, and I know I haven't talked about too many, but one coin certainly comes to mind, those at the top of the Ponzi scheme tend to constantly be on the lookout for new investors in order to pay back the old ones. They're also often living the high life, spending millions upon millions of dollars, and eventually the scheme falls out from under them when their lies are discovered or they run out of money. But with Madoff, this isn't exactly the case. And don't get me wrong, his net assets were still over $800 million by the time this Ponzi scheme failed, so he most certainly was living up that high life. But considering that his scheme was a $65 billion scam, it was far more doable and he was far more sneaky. Rather than constantly be on the lookout for investors, Madoff had investors coming to him. Rather than exclusively spend on houses and jets and luxurious things, Madoff spent money on charities, implying he had money to spare and also to make him look good. He seemed to avoid getting caught early by giving back to investors quickly and to keep the appearance of legitimacy. And again, to reiterate, he did have a genuine brokerage operation at first. His Ponzi scheme wasn't based off of nothing from the get-go. Bernie, you see, was playing the long game and a very, very long game indeed. He used his reputation against people and manipulated their trust. And it wasn't until the 90s when the cracks began to show. This is, as I said, one of the biggest Ponzi schemes in history. So let me apologize in advance if I miss anything because holy hell, there is so much to discuss here. But let's dip our toes into the 1990s and begin in 1992. Madoff still had a fantastic reputation outwardly. The Wall Street Journal described him as this, one of the masters of the off exchange third market and the bane of the New York Stock Exchange. He has built a highly profitable securities firm, Bernard L. Madoff Investment Securities, which siphons a huge volume of stock trades away from the big board. The $740 million average daily volume of trades executed electronically by the Madoff firm off the exchange equals 9% of the New York exchanges. 
Mr. Madoff's firm can execute trades so quickly and cheaply that it actually pays other brokerage firms a penny a share to execute their customers' orders, profiting from the spread between bid and asked prices that most stocks trade for. However, behind the scenes, the trust he built with the SEC was wearing thin. Forbes even wrote an article back in 2008 that the SEC may had been able to have stopped Madoff back in 1992. They stated that, the Securities and Exchange Commission might have unearthed Madoff's massive scheme in 1992 through its scrutiny of a feeder fund back then. In late 1992, the agency filed suit against a Florida investment firm, Avellino and Beans, accusing it of selling $440 million of unregistered securities to 3,200 investors. The company funneled the investments to a single manager and promised clients a curiously steady 13.5% to 20% annual return, the SEC said at the time, but the scrutiny didn't go any deeper. The Avellino firm was shut down in 1993 and the money was tracked down and returned to investors. It turns out Madoff was the sole manager who took in the Avellino money. In a December 1992 interview with the Wall Street Journal, Madoff himself explained he didn't know the funds had been raised illegally and added that his performance tracked the 10-year performance of the Standard & Poor's 500, hardly notable. The relationship between Frank Avellino, Michael Beans, and Madoff had grown so lucrative that according to the journal article, Avellino abandoned their accounting business in 1984 to focus on investments full-time, a fact that also got them in trouble with the SEC, which accused them of running an unregistered investment company. This is one of the first times we can place Madoff in hot water with the SEC, but it wasn't enough. The thing is, during Madoff's Ponzi scheme, he claimed that he could give people a 10% return. One woman interviewed for the Scamming of America documentary states that it was this number that believed he was legitimate. Anything more than that 15 or 20%, she states, would have raised her suspicions. And so this investment strategy that was discovered in 1992 that promised investments of 18 to 20% most certainly looked more suspicious to anyone giving it a second glance. The thing is, I don't want to say that if someone makes one mistake, you should be suspicious of everything they do. But at the same time, if the SEC learned that Madoff was part of this decades long scam involving large sums of money, then wouldn't the next logical step to be to take a look at the other investment companies he's running? And surely it wouldn't be too difficult to realize he was lying there too. In court, Madoff admitted that he never bought or sold a single share of stock since the early 1990s. And he just deposited investor money straight into his own account. So I'm with Forbes on this one. Madoff could have been caught much sooner, but whether it was because of his reputation or his very well-cooked books, he wasn't. Even the SEC admits this was on their part, a massive oversight. SEC chairman Christopher Cox acknowledged that the agency missed several warning signs. I am gravely concerned by the apparent multiple failures over at least a decade to thoroughly investigate these allegations or at any point to seek formal authority to pursue them. This wasn't the only red flag though, nor the only complaint about Madoff in the 1990s. There were two others in fact, from Edward Thorpe and Harry Markopoulos. At the time, perhaps these complaints were seen as flukes. Now looking back, and of course hindsight's 2020, these were in fact clear indicators of how bad things were going to get for those that had fallen for Madoff's scheme. According to one Forbes article by Robert Lenzner, It took only one day in 1991 for legendary math genius and card sharp Edward Thorpe to discover that Bernard Madoff's hedge fund operation was a fraud. This discovery was a full decade before Boston whistleblower Harry Markopoulos came to the same conclusion and tried unsuccessfully to alert the SEC and the media as to the huge Ponzi scheme. Thorpe advised his clients to liquidate their investment with Madoff, but never revealed his finding to the regulators or the investment community. Thorpe saw that Madoff claimed to have purchased 123 call options on Procter & Gamble's shares on April 16, 1991, but only 20 P&G options in total had changed hands that day. Thorpe then investigated further and found that there was not the volume in options for IBM, Disney, or Merck's shares to handle the trades Madoff claimed he executed. Thorpe may have been the first to discover that Madoff could not have been hedging his customers' accounts because the actual report volume and trading in stock options was a small fraction of the trades that he alone was claiming. In other words, Madoff's so-called investing strategy was impossible to execute. The tragedy is that discovery of Madoff's fraud in 1991 could have stopped him when he was relatively a small fry, preventing him from growing his business into tens of billions of dollars. Even though other observers wondered how he could have handled the trading Madoff claimed, no one ever sought to out him until Markopoulos wrote the SEC in 2000. And this really kills me. And we'll get into Markopoulos in a second, but what happened with Thorpe absolutely just 
it just kills me. He had some serious solid evidence against Madoff in 1991 when the Ponzi scheme was still in its infancy, but it doesn't seem like anyone took him seriously or he wasn't able to spread the word to enough people to make an impact. And that is a shame. I think what bothers me about this the most is that Thorpe was clearly able to discover this on his own, whereas the SEC didn't even bother to look into Madoff's claims. There was undeniably concrete proof of his scam beginning as early as 1991. So many people were hurt and reading this, it feels needless that they were hurt and all the more frustrating because it could have been stopped. But now let's talk about Markopoulos' role in all of this and when he entered the picture. And also sorry if I'm jumping around just a little bit with my timelines here. Like I said, a lot happened in this case, but anyway. Harry Markopoulos also worked on Wall Street as a broker. He used to be with Makefield Securities, then went to Darien Capital Management and Rampart Investment Management, where he first spotted problems with Bernie Madoff's revenue streams. Today, he works as a forensic accounting analyst for attorneys suing companies under the False Claims Act. Markets Insider states that after doing analytical detective work where he tried to replicate Madoff's returns, Markopoulos figured out that Madoff must be committing fraud of some kind and reported his findings to the Securities and Exchange Commission. His view was that Madoff was either running a massive Ponzi scheme or was front running using his order flow. The SEC was slow to act according to the Wall Street Journal. Markopoulos made numerous filings to the agency in 2000, 2001, and 2005. Some were ignored because the firm Markopoulos was working for at the time was a competitor to Madoff's, the Wall Street Journal reported. Markopoulos is largely responsible for Madoff's eventual arrest in 2008 because he refused to let up despite facing many roadblocks along the way. Markopoulos tells NPR's Steve Inskeep that one of the problems with the SEC was regional turf rivalries between the Boston and New York offices that resulted in a lack of communication between the two. They got along about as well as the Yankees and Red Sox did, unfortunately. He also says the SEC is staffed by lawyers who don't understand the mathematically complex financial products that are traded on the markets these days. Finally, Markopoulos describes poor investigative ability at the SEC. One staffer at the agency wouldn't follow up on his tips because he wasn't an employee of Madoff's and she therefore didn't consider Markopoulos an insider. That same person in her deposition said that the only way I would qualify as a whistleblower is if I came in with a tape recording of Bernie Madoff admitting he was running a Ponzi scheme, Markopoulos says. Obviously I didn't have that tape. And if I did, I wouldn't have needed the SEC. As much as this episode is about Bernie Madoff, I suppose that in part, it is about the SEC too. Even though I use the SEC and other agencies of the federal government as sources in my research, this serves as a good reminder that they're far from infallible. And just as we saw earlier with Thorpe, it wasn't all that difficult for Markopoulos to discover Madoff's Ponzi scheme either. That's still not to say that Madoff didn't disguise it well, but there were some obvious discrepancies and issues that they could have easily uncovered if only they had tried. Markopoulos and his team analyzed publicly available information about Madoff's network of feeder funds from offshore companies. The team pretended they wanted to invest in these funds. Markopoulos says he knew he was dealing with a fraud within minutes of examining the materials. I read his strategy statement and it was so poorly put together, Markopoulos recalls. His strategy as depicted would have trouble beating a zero return and his performance chart went up at a 45 degree line. That line doesn't exist in finance. It only exists in geometry classes. But Markopoulos says his bosses were taken in by Madoff's reputation. And as I've said many times before, and I'll say it right now, and I'll say it again in the future, if something sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Even though the SEC took their time in investigating Madoff, others began to suspect him in 2001 as well. Aaron E. Averland wrote an article entitled, Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Bernie Madoff is so secretive, he even asked his investors to keep mum. She began questioning his numbers and said, remarkably, some of the larger billion dollar Madoff run funds had never had a down year. And now anyone who knows just the basics of investments knows that this simply is not how things work. Even other hedge fund marketers, ones that had assets with Madoff, didn't understand how Madoff did so well when others simply didn't. But Madoff consistently ignored and dismissed skepticism and went so far as to request that his investors not tell people about him. And that's probably one of the biggest red flags I've heard thus far. Hey, don't tell people about me? Yeah, that's not something you want to hear from someone managing your money. Now, before we continue on to start discussing the downfall, starting with the charities, let's go ahead and take a quick break to thank today's sponsors. I love cereal as a kid, but I gave it up as an adult because it's actually full of stuff that I really just shouldn't eat, like tons and tons of added sugars. But that's what's so great about Magic Spoon cereals. I can have a great tasting cereal when I want without the crap. 
And Magic Spoon has ridiculously good flavors that will take you back to watching Sunday morning cartoons. They've got classics like the cocoa, frosted, peanut butter, and my favorite, the fruity one. But to be fair, all of them are pretty good. And Magic Spoon has zero grams of sugar, 14 grams of protein, and only four net grams of carbs in each serving. It's also only 140 calories. Now I've started to veer off the course of the tried and true, the fruity cereal, and I've moved on to the frosted now. I don't know why, I don't know what sparked it into me one day to start eating it again, but once again, not disappointed. So click the link below and use my code Mondays for $5 off. You can build your very own variety box with some of their amazing flavors. And if you don't like it, they'll refund your money. No questions asked. So click the link below and use code Mondays for $5 off or go to magicspoon.com slash Mondays to save $5 off your order today. Also for my Canadian listeners, Magic Spoon is also now shipping to Canada. If you're carrying a credit card balance every month, getting out of debt can feel like an uphill battle. You're just pushing the debt rock up the hill only for it to fall back to the bottom over and over and over again. But that's where Upstart can help. Upstart is the quick and easy way to get a personal loan, and all of it is done online. Upstart is expanding access to affordable credit because we're all more than just our credit scores. That's why they consider your income and current employment to find a better rate for you. And with a five minute online rate check, you can see your rate upfront for loans between $1,000 to $50,000, no matter what you need it for. Find out how Upstart can lower your monthly payments today when you go to upstart.com slash MLM. That's upstart.com slash MLM. Don't forget to use our URL to let them know we sent you. Loan amounts will be determined based on your credit, income, and certain other information provided in your loan application. So make sure to go to upstart.com slash MLM to get started today. It wasn't until 2008 that things truly fell apart during the recession. By then, Madoff had access to wealthier people more than ever. One documentary about him explains that he started off by targeting people in his community, often the Jewish community in Long Island, his friends from school, Jewish country clubs, Catskill resorts, you name it. That's how Madoff got his start because people in his own community were bound to trust Madoff more than a total stranger. And as he moved into wealthier neighborhoods, he just had wealthier people to target and the cycle could continue. But as he got bigger, Madoff had more connections. He talked to SEC regulators directly, but still attended the funerals of family members that were close to his clients. He said he had access to NASDAQ, the first electronic stock market, but he could always be reached by telephone. Madoff seemed by most accounts at the time to be perfectly good and a likable person, which obviously you have to be if you're gonna run a Ponzi scheme. No wonder it took the SEC so long to investigate him if he was considered one of their own. However, what truly gives Madoff his horrible reputation and what helped him get away with this for so long is that Madoff wasn't just interested in the individuals he met with and their millions, but the charities they were involved with too. Madoff didn't become active in charitable causes because he cared. It was because there was more money to be had. What he did was find investors that could be counted on not to withdraw their money and charities fit the bill. Their conservatism made charities a perfect target for Madoff. And although hedge funds made up the largest portion of Madoff's assets, charities were no small drop in the bucket either. One of the most notable people affected by Madoff was Elie Wiesel, a Nobel Peace Prize winner, Holocaust survivor, and author. He wrote the book Night, memoirs of his experience at the Auschwitz concentration camp. And I remember actually having to read this book and do a report on it one year. And although I can't say I adored it or anything, it was an interesting and heartbreaking look. And to find out that he was scammed by Madoff is devastating. Time Magazine wrote about Fiesel's experiences on the day he passed away, July 2nd, 2016, and they wrote, Elie Wiesel listened to his son tell him that Bernie Madoff had been arrested for swindling millions of dollars from unsuspecting investors. In addition to their savings, Wiesel and his wife Marion had lost $15 million for the Elie Wiesel Foundation for Humanity, an organization they had founded together to promote tolerance and equality. After Wiesel put down the phone, he turned to his wife. We looked at each other and our reaction was, we have seen worse, said Wiesel, who survived Auschwitz concentration camp where he was sent when he was 15. Both she and I have seen worse. Word soon spread that the foundation had been hit by Madoff's scheme and Fiesel described what happened next as something very beautiful. All of a sudden, we began receiving hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of letters and donations, small donations from all over America, Jews and non-Jews. The American people are so generous. We've received hundreds from them and that helped us. Wiesel, who died on July 2nd at age 87, concluded that his goal following the Madoff swindle was not to change his outlook. It didn't make me more pessimistic. 
And Wiesel's spirit is incredible here. His strength is one that I envy. Unfortunately, he wasn't the only one with a charity that suffered from Madoff schemes, and some had to close their doors after losing all their funding. The documentary poses a question to us around the time it discusses these charities. Did Bernie start as an honest man that completely lost his way or a dishonest man that tried to appear legitimate in the early years to better swindle people? Frankly, I don't think it matters hearing about the charities that were forced to shut down as a result of his scheme. Bernie may have started out as honest or genuine, or perhaps he never was. I can't speak to his true intentions, only he will know that for sure. Regardless of what they were, as of 1991, he was undeniably a horrible human being. How could anyone do this to an innocent individual or a group of charities is beyond me. However, the primary source of Madoff's money came from hedge funds. These are privately pooled investment funds from the wealthy. And as the documentary puts it, it's a side of the investment world explicitly designed to be aggressive, unregulated corner cutting. What a great context for a swindler. Madoff depended on his global aristocracy for the super rich. Madoff was an insider and therefore he knew what the people around him were looking for. Hedge funds were turning over fantastic money, but at the time people didn't always trust them. People wanted steady growth and a more reliable growth at that. This is why Madoff had feeder funds. He didn't technically run a hedge fund, but he had hedge fund managers that set up investment pools for him, feeder funds. The fund managers fed billions of dollars to Madoff and in return, they got hefty fees from transactions, 20% of profits. During prosperous times, these fees were normal. The boom economy camouflaged the fraud as the documentary puts it. People were counting on the economy to keep growing. So it wasn't a stretch for them to think that Madoff was growing their money too. At least those of them that even knew Madoff had it. Another thing that led Madoff to getting away with this for so long was the fact that so many investors thought their money was invested in these funds. In some cases, even in a bank, they had no idea where the end result was. One of the feeder funds caught Stephen Greenspan's eye in 2007. Greenspan claims that a family member told him about an investment they had with a fund called Rye. And when Greenspan looked at their history, it seemed incredible. Again, too good to be true. His family member kept getting the same 1% growth every month, regardless of what the stock market was doing. And this is what didn't quite make sense to Greenspan. How could these funds defy the stock market? There's some debate about how much these fund managers actually knew. After all, if they weren't doing the research, then they too should be held accountable. I'm not sure that these managers are all aware as to the scope of the problem, but regardless, I'd say they were turning a blind eye. But as we said, Markopoulos didn't let up. In 2005, the SEC finally met with him and he laid out two possibilities to explain Madoff's unreal performance. One was that he was running a Ponzi scheme. The other was that he was front running a form of insider trading. Front running is having inside information in advance of where a stock is moving just by your position in the industry. Obviously, neither of these are legal, but there was no other explanation for the numbers that Madoff had. Price manipulation or Ponzi scheme, both are guaranteed profit for people like Madoff. In fact, many assumed that Madoff did have some control of the market, but they wanted to get in on it. The problem here is that the SEC actually gave Madoff a quote, clean bill of health in 2006 from front running. Then once they did that, the SEC pretty much just dismissed Markopoulos' point, which was that it wasn't front running, then it was a Ponzi scheme. If anything, the SEC only legitimized Madoff further, dismissing the possibility that he was a scam artist. And this is why there's so much speculation as to Madoff's closeness to the SEC itself and how it played a role, how he sat on committees and how his family members were on regulatory panels. Perhaps the SEC didn't want to believe that one of their own could do such a thing, or maybe they too were willing to turn a blind eye to Madoff's suspicious activity. Markopoulos stated, clearly the SEC was afraid of Madoff. I gift wrapped and delivered the largest Ponzi scheme in history to them and somehow they couldn't be bothered to conduct a thorough investigation. The documentary also makes a point that the SEC was never important to the Clinton administration at the time and there was a push to deregulate it. So the lack of funding absolutely played a part too. However, lack of funding or not, it's clear that the SEC in essence helped Madoff get away with this for so long. But eventually it was the economic crash in 2008 that took Madoff down with it. People began to panic withdrawing their money and Madoff couldn't pay them all back. So of all the ways to be found out, Bernie confessed. There's a lot of speculation as to how much his family members knew, of course, because his wife apparently withdrew $15 million on two occasions and one was the day before he confessed. His sons and other family members worked at the Madoff firm too. The dynamic, as the documentary puts it, was Shakespearean. It's a financial version of Lord of the Flies and it's going to pit victim against victim. But one man, Frank DiPascali, was definitely aware of the fraud. 
According to Reuters, during three decades of working for Bernie Madoff, Frank DePascali said he knew his boss was running an illegal scheme, but the longtime aide also maintained he believed Madoff's claims that he had hidden assets to cover his customers' liabilities until a meeting in Madoff's office one evening in late 2008. He turned to me and said, crying, I'm at the end of my rope. DePascali testified in federal court in New York on Tuesday. I don't have any more goddamn money. The whole goddamn thing is a fraud. Only days later, Madoff was under arrest. DePascali, who pleaded guilty and is the prosecution's star witness, has been testifying in the US District Court in Manhattan for more than a week, detailing how he and the defendants conspired to falsify documents, fool regulators, and hide the fraud from the firm's clients. And honestly, I've got little to no sympathy for them, and I'm sure you all too, when we go through some of these victim stories, if you don't already, that is. Madoff lied for decades about what he was doing, whether it was the nature of the fraud or the entire Ponzi scheme itself. The only reason he confessed is because with the economic crash, it was only a matter of time until he was caught. We've got no evidence to suggest that had the economy kept climbing, he would have admitted what he was doing was wrong. But Madoff's actions didn't just cost people money, they took lives. And also before we continue on, I just wanna put a quick trigger warning here for mentions of suicide and self-harm. According to ABC News, a well-respected French investment fund manager who put at least $1.4 billion of his client's money and perhaps much or all of his own wealth in the hands of alleged Ponzi scheme operator, Bernard Madoff, appears to have committed suicide in his Manhattan office, according to police officials. He was found inside the Madison Avenue offices of his investment group, Access International Advisors, at about 7.30 a.m. this morning and pronounced dead at 8 a.m., according to the New York City Medical Examiner. He was found seated at his desk where he apparently had bled to death after taking an overdose of sleeping pills and then slashing his arm, bicep, and his wrist, police said. They found the man at his desk, New York City Police Commissioner Raymond Kelly said, there was no suicide note. It appears there were cuts made to his arm, to his wrist, and also to his bicep area with a box cutter. This was only shortly after Madoff was arrested. Everything that this company had worked for was crumbling down and would be lost. And this is an absolute tragedy and I feel horribly for the family. Yet he wasn't the only one that felt this way, not even in the slightest. In October, 2011, ABC put out another article on Madoff and his wife's plan to end their own lives too. The wife of convicted Ponzi schemer, Bernie Madoff, says that she and Bernie were so upset after the collapse of his multi-billion dollar fraud that they decided to commit suicide together on Christmas Eve. I don't know whose idea it was, but we decided to kill ourselves because it was so horrendous that it was happening, Ruth Madoff told Morley Safer of CBS News. We had terrible phone calls, hate mail, just beyond anything. And I had said, I just can't go on anymore. Ruth Madoff said she and her husband drowned pills, Ambien and perhaps Clonopin on Christmas Eve, 2008, just after her sons, Mark and Andrew had turned Bernie into federal authorities. She said she didn't mix the pills with alcohol because she was afraid they would vomit the pills back up. I took what we had, he took more, said Ruth. We took pills and woke up the next day. It was very impulsive and I'm glad we woke up. But her account of the Christmas Eve suicide is questioned by the head of the private security firm hired to guard them, who was at the apartment that night until about 7 p.m. Sitting there and talking with them, I didn't see anything unusual, said Nick Cassale. I was going to interject really quickly here and see that while Cassale may have not seen anything suspicious, that doesn't confirm or deny Ruth's account. Regardless of Madoff's plans, what he did was despicable, but I'm not going to say that this alone is proof that Ruth is lying. She and Madoff could have easily pretended things were fine too, but anyways, continuing on. Ruth's son, Mark, committed suicide two years later on December 11th, 2010, at the second anniversary of his father's arrest. Mark's wife, Stephanie, told Chris Cuomo of ABC News' 2020 that Mark felt Ruth was wrong to stand by Bernie. He couldn't understand how she could continuously stand by this man who ruined so many lives, who ruined his life, said Stephanie. Stephanie said she blamed both Ruth and Bernie for her husband, Mark's death. Yes, I'm angry at her, said Stephanie. If you're angry at her, asked Cuomo, how do you feel about Bernie? I hate Bernie Madoff, answered Stephanie. If I saw Bernie Madoff right now, I would tell him that I hold him fully responsible for killing my husband and I'd spit in his face. Ruth went into hiding in Florida after Madoff went into prison, even dyeing her hair red in an effort to avoid being recognized when she returned to New York. Ruth hasn't been charged while her husband, the infamous Bernie Madoff himself, has been sentenced to 150 years. The absolute devastation left behind in his wake is horrific. Swiss asset managers were among the biggest investors in Madoff's scheme, with firms based in Geneva particularly hard hit. About 70% of Santander clients accepted a Bernie Madoff settlement when clients had invested with Madoff through the Spanish bank Grupo Santander lost money. The Austrian bank Medici was on the brink of collapse when Madoff was exposed because according to its former CEO, Helmut Frey, 90% of the bank's income was generated out of Madoff funds. 
They did fail in 2009, just as many banks and charities suffered in Madoff's wake. And this truly devastated people. Bernie Madoff went from a trusted man to one of the most hated. And well, in my opinion, he deserved it. His scheme was for $65 billion, while only about 17 billion was ever recovered. At the time, the eventual 7 billion taken from the Madoff estate was the largest forfeiture in law enforcement history. So at least that's something recovered for victims, I'm sure, but it's probably little consolidation. Diana Henriques from the New York Times told the Scamming of America documentary, I have never seen anything like this. I have never had to read about anything like this. Nothing on this scale, nothing that swept so far around the world, nothing that lasted so long nothing that brought in so many investors. And hopefully we don't see anything quite like this ever again, or at least not for a very long time. And in the final event to this saga, AP News reports, Bernie Madoff, the infamous architect of an epic security swindle that burned thousands of investors, outfoxed regulators, and earned him a 150 year prison term, died behind bars early Wednesday. He was 82. Bernie Madoff apparently died from natural causes in Federal Medical Center in Butner, a federal prison for inmates with special needs near Butner, North Carolina, on April 14th, 2021. So on that sad note, that's where we're going to end today's episode. I hope you learned something or perhaps got some clarification as to what exactly happened with Bernie Madoff and the massive Ponzi scheme that surrounded him. Thank you so much for making it to the end of this week's episode. I appreciate you being here. Make sure that you're following, liking, subscribing so that you can stay up to date on all the latest episodes and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.